Yo, peace, world. Pappy, come on, Freeman, checking in. Um, public service announcement. Black people are afraid, but black people are going to have to get over their fear. Black people do not know what is happening, but black people are going to have to learn and understand what is happening. Black people are not thinking, but black people are going to have to begin thinking. Black people are not being quiet, but black people are going to have to start getting quiet so that they can think. Black people are not analyzing and planning, but black people are going to have to begin analyzing and planning. Black people do not understand deep self-respect, but black people are going to have to learn the, re the meaning and practice of deep self-respect. Black people are going to have to stop permitting black children to play with parenthood. Black people are going to have to stop moaning, rocking, crying, complaining, begging. Black people are going to have to stop thinking that rhyme and rhetoric will solve problems. Black people are going to have to stop finger popping and singing. Black people are going to have to stop finger popping and singing. Black people are going to have to stop dancing and clowning. Black people are going to have to stop laughing and listening to loud radios. All these behaviors and many more have absolutely nothing to do with addressing the challenges and conditions of the open warfare continuously being waged against the black collective. That is Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, one of my teachers who I had the distinguished honor of befriending and honoring. All right. Uh, that's my public service announcement for the town hall meeting uh, this Thursday, November the, tw uh, the 14th at 6.30. It's the 2024 presidential election progress or disaster uh, assessing the impact of the state of black America in the pan-African world. Uh, this is convened by the Institute of, of, of the Black World and Dr. Ron Daniels. Uh, it's a list of um, speakers here. Um, the average age is probably like 70 years old in this, this panel, and the, whereas the median age in Washington, D.C. is like 35. So we need to really start forging some intergenerational dialogue. So why don't y'all come out? If you got a problem with, um, um, you know, there's been some, some qualitative critiques of the lineup, um, I'm... I'm here to agree. There should be some young people involved with this. We should be having um, a pathway, a clear pathway for young people to assume positions of leadership and the elders should be passing the baton. We should be gaining w from the wisdom of our elders and the youth of uh, and the energy of our youth. All right. So I'm, I'm here to say that. But again, let's start somewhere. And I think a great place to start is Thursday, uh, November the 14th at 6.30 p.m. at the historic New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. And again, it's 1313 New York Avenue, Washington, D.C. You can get more information on the WEAC Radio um, IG page or WEAC Radio uh, Facebook. Uh, or you can go to Institute of Black World. That's IBW21.org. IBW21.org. I hope to see some of you there. And I hope some of you are fired up and um, are beyond party and bullshit. All right? So here we go. I prefer um, a, a real villain to a fake hero. That's Killer Mike. All right. Uh, I want to share with y'all my testimony that I have been uh, working all day uh, to prepare for um, going before the D.C. Council on, on, on Friday. Um, I'm representing We Act Radio. So um, because I'm not an individual, I'm repping as an organization. I get five minutes instead of the prerequisite three minutes. But I got so much to say about um, these people trying to cut emergency rental assistance program. I'm getting to, I'm gonna say everything I say. So, so bear with me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read through my um, testimony. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut it down um, because I'm, I'm clocking in well over um, seven minutes. So uh, I hope that you um, give me court indulgence here uh, to, to read what I have to hear. And I'm open to any critiques, uh, of course, live streams, don't record your comments. So when you're when I post this video um, after the real time, I won't be able to read your comments. So if you have a critique, um, you can add it to the comments when you see this video posted. Okay. All right. Here we go. The system that exists in this city, the system that exists in these so-called United States and around the world. It's a system that undermines the humanity, quality of life of people of African descent, people of color, and poor people in general. 
This is proven to be so in a nation's capital where the average white family has 81 times the wealth of the average black family. According to the Urban Institute in 2014, the typical white household in D.C. had a net worth of 284000 whereas black households had a net worth of only 3500 By all indications, it has only gotten worse. But there has been no emergency legislation to address these government policy-induced inequities. No retention plan for long-time residents or small businesses. Rather, this council has unanimously voted to move forward to deny that housing is a human right. Martin Luther King said that a budget is a moral document. So the mayor's proposed budget cuts funding for ERAP by $42 million, which will leave the program with $20 million, less than half of last year's budget. Last year, the mayor's budget proposed cutting ERAP funding to just $8 million, an immoral document indeed. Just like D.C. has more police per person than any city in America, and America has more prisons than any nation in the world, we still hear the calls for even more police and even longer prison sentences, which clearly are not the answers to the prevention of crime and violence. Like we must get to the root causes of crime and violence, we must get to the root causes of the housing crisis. Let's be clear, since December 2023, the number of evictions per month in D.C. has already tripled from the year before. D.C. is one of the most expensive cities to live in America, with a cost of living over 144% more than the national average. A study by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition found that D.C. had the highest intensity of gentrification of any city in the United States between 2000 and 2013, where they displaced more people than New York City. Again, no emergency legislation to address a retention plan for long-time residents or small businesses. Rather, Phil Mendelson introduced the ERAP reform bill on an emergency basis, which means it only requires one castle vote and the mayor's signature, which is why they have the audacity, the caucasity, to make these tone-deaf elitist statements. We hope that people now recognize the consequences of non-rent payment, Mayor Bowser. Basically, what we're getting at is it will now not be possible to continue to game the system. My favorite local nemesis, Chairman Mendelssohn. Gaming the system. Wow. The D.C. metro area had the highest rate increase in the nation in 2024. Rarely do our council chair and the mayor agree on anything except at the expense of the working class people still left in this city. We all know they have had very heated and public disputes, but they always seem to gather, come together to punch down. In 2023, the pending caseload case load for the landlord and tenant branch, I despise the term landlord, we are not uh, serfs, and this is not uh, feudal Europe, um, the building owner and tenant branch, grew by 23% with more cases pending than at any point in the past 10 years, despite the number of filings being significantly less than prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. That means more people were actually trying to catch up and pay their bills and stay in their homes. Amending DC official code takes away judges' discretion and limits the number of stays a court can apply for a pending ERAP application to one per case. This motivates the building owner to remove long-time tenants who may be locked into a lower rent level for newer tenants for a high-level rent increase. This opens the door for building owners to not comply with the ERAP application process by not providing information only to achieve a desired eviction. Removing the barriers of tenants from being evicted from their homes as long as they had a pending application for ERAP funds is as inhumane and immoral as the mayor's proposed budget cuts. Housing prices are artificially high and have turned the American home into a financial product first and a place of shelter second. If Kenya McDuffie was our tenure, atten, attorney general, at least Elisa Silverman was still on the council, Aaron Palmer was our council chairwoman, and Robert White was our mayor, perhaps you wouldn't have any of these problems. Our council chairman, and my favorite nemesis, has had no plan to crack down on housing code violations to protect low-income, black and brown, or non-English speaking tenants, where many are forced to live in conditions that will get a restaurant shut down overnight. He has instead spent years pushing anti-homeless and anti-working class policies endangering DC's most vulnerable. 
What happened to the plan for a Green New Deal for housing that would have created a social housing model much like the successful framework found in Vienna, Austria? Did it suffer the same fate as the Green New Deal in Congress? What happened to the $82 million in the Housing Produ Production Trust Fund that the city government misused? Were they gaming the system too? In a post article dated January 29, 2016, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser said that she has allocated more than $82 million from the city's housing production trust fund for the creation or preservation of more than 800 units of affordable housing. The promise to expand affordable housing in a city of skyrocketing rents was a corner cornerstone of the mayor's campaign. We all know that housing affordability is one, if not the top issue in the District of Columbia, Bowser said at a news conference at the City Department of Housing and Community Development Headquarters in Southeast. And everything that we do is going to help make more people be able to afford to live in Washington, D.C. Five years later, the Inspector General announced that the same exact amount had been misused. The audit found that the funds were spent on income brackets below 80% of the median income instead of going to extremely low income households. Was she gaming the system too? Let's be clear on what constitutes low income in Washington, D.C. The median salary in Washington, D.C. is about $77,000 with 80% of salaries falling between $35,000 and $167,000. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, who also says that no one should be paying more than 30% of the income plus utilities and housing, but it's not a law, it's just a guideline. That's what it determines if you can afford something or not in terms of financing. All right, we'll get back to that. Um, HUD adjusts the low income threshold in the DC metro, order to, uh, DC metro area to account for the high cost of living. In 2023, HUD defined low income as up to $95,000 for a family of four and up to $67,000 for a single person. That means if your family income is under $95,000 or you as an individual make less than $67,000, that means that you are low income, boo-boo. In this de de democratically run city, we're supposed to be afraid of Trump taking over. He has threatened to displace major government agencies outside the Beltway. With the federal government being one of the largest employers in the city, it will only exacerbate the displacement of the last remnants of Chocolate City. The housing crisis is driven by corporate control over the political and economic destinies of this city. Folks in their elected offices oftentimes are having to capitulate to corporate interests or mainstream political interests in order to secure the finances and get into the, the networks that get them elected while delivering only, for the most part, symbolic victories to the masses of low-income folks in this city. And until folks are clear about undermining the way in which the corporate sector is essentially able to curate folks that come before our community <laughs> that become elected officials in a still majority black city, until folks are willing to come to grips with that, we are essentially rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. The Emer Emergency Rental Assistance Reform Amendment Act in this city with the highest rent increase in the nation is proof of this. All right, that's my testimony. I know that was long. I had to get it off my chest.